The second speaker on our session around the theme of uh, women is going to be by Jordi Reigns. Jordi is an independent researcher with a BA in history from King's College and an MA from the Court of the Institute of Art in London. The title of her talk is Jewish Women, English Dress, Refugees and Women in Uniform in Wartime England. Over to you, Jordi. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you for allowing me to participate in this. It's very exciting. This is my first conference, and I feel very gratified that this gets to be my first experience speaking publicly um, in an academic setting. So, what can images of women's dress tell us about the processes of redefining national belonging and reimagining Jewish identities in wartime England? Dress served as an indication of integration into or exclusion from British society for refugees. This is visible in two sets of photographs that I will analyze. The first is the attire of kinder transport refugees and they indicate a performance of nationality, of Englishness. Uh, and the second set is the attire of refugees serving in uniform, which indicate performance of nationality and also give us understandings of Jewish identity. Um, so, a pamphlet produced by the German Jewish Aid Committee in 1938 entitled While You Are in England, Helpful Information and Guidance for Every Refugee emphasized the importance of blending in. It insisted that clothing be understated and conventional and adhere to English standards of modesty and decorum. Uh, so there's a quote here. Um, the Englishman greatly dislikes ostentation, loudness of dress or manner, or unconventionality of dress or manner. The Englishman attaches very great importance to modesty and quietness of dress and manner. This accurately describes the approach many refugees in Britain took, which was often to their detriment. Uh, so in April of 1939, a 14-year-old girl named Lorraine Salzbacher boarded a train taking Jewish children from Germany to England for safekeeping. This would become known as kinder transport uh, and would bring roughly 10,000 children from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia to the UK. Figure one shows Lorraine Sulzbacher with her foster family. Um, so she's just there in the middle. Um, and she is visiting them for the first time um, in their home in Lincolnshire. Uh, it's likely that this photo was taken to commemorate her arrival so in this uh, photo, Sulzbacher wears a very proper and neat, plain and understated dress. Her smile, her possession of the dog's leash and the protective arm of Mrs. Schrieber, her foster mother, around her shoulders indicate, at least for the sake of this photo, if not in reality, that Sulzbacher has been accepted and integrated into this English family. However, her upright posture and extreme neatness and the bright, fresh clothing she's wearing do not indicate a refugee visually, and it separates her somewhat from her foster family. This was an issue for many Jewish refugees arriving in Britain. They often, when they fled Europe, took only the best clothing with them, as it was hoped that this, these would last the longest. Um, they would also allow these refugees to feel and to look presentable upon arriving in their host country. Um, a kinder transport refugee, Bertha Leverton, whose oral history I used for my research, a point against us in the UK because when we arrived in our best clothes, it wasn't the way the British expected refugees to look. We were too tidy and presentable. The stylish, well-made clothing of formerly middle-class refugees was incongruous with English perceptions of their social standings. It marked them as different, led to a lack of empathy from the English populace, and for Jewish refugees in the workforce, it often sparked hostility from their co-workers or their managers. Um, in some cases, performing Englishness was easier for younger refugees. Returning to Sulzbacher in figure one, her attire indicates a girl on the brink of womanhood. Her dress is, has a Peter Pan collar, which hints at youthfulness. Yet the length of her hem, which falls well below her knees, suggests uh, adhering to conventions of propriety and modesty that were expected of women, not girls. For many kinder transport refugees, the ability to sartorially blend with their peers depended in part on the care of their foster mothers. 
Foster mothers dressed younger children, many of whom enjoyed the anonymity of school uniforms. And for girls like Sulzbacher, who arrived during a time of personal transition from childhood to womanhood, foster mothers served as role models for how to present oneself as a woman in a strange new country. We can't know exactly what the relationship between Sulzbacher and Mrs. Schrieber, as seen here, um, was, but this figure suggests that there is some closeness, which you can see through their physical proximity and their touch. Sulzbacher's dressed in a fashionable English style dress, which shows very clear signs of rationing and utility dress schemes with paired back fabric and um, visual interest without added fabric. Um, and she is now dressed in the appropriate attire to perform her Englishness. And as it's a few years after she's already been there, we have to give some credit to her foster mother for her appearance. So moving on to Jewish women in uniform. In July 1943, all single and married women ages 16 to 51 were conscripted into some form of war work. This was also the year that uh, Lorraine Solzbacher joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service or the ATS, which was the women's branch of the army. Despite being classed as enemy aliens due to their German or Austrian passports, many female Jewish refugees, especially kinder transport girls, joined the war effort. War work of all kinds, including the armed forces like the ATS or civilian services like uh, local fire watch, war nurseries and the Women's Land Army or WLA, offered Jewish refugees uniforms and it offered them a sense of pride. So figure three on the left shows Lorraine Solzbacher in her ATS uniform in 1943. She looks proudly past the camera in the top photo and is grinning very genuinely in the bottom photo. Her expressions suggest fulfillment and excitement and her war work would give her both as on June 12th, 1944, she became the first Jewish service woman to serve overseas after D-Day. So war work was a contribution to England and a display of loyalty. It was also a contribution towards the cause of Jews in Europe. Ruth Schneider, another kinder transport refugee whose oral histories I looked at, um, also served in the ATS uh, working with anti-aircraft guns. She claimed that she reveled at the chance to get her own back uh, and do her part to actively stop Hitler and stop the Nazis. So more than just a source of pride, being in military uniform allowed Jewish refugees to integrate more easily into English society without forsaking their Jewishness. Multiple refugees sit, cite that Jews in the services experienced a good humored, kindly tolerance and no anti-Semitism while they were serving in uniform. For some, this was reaffirming because they had spent almost a decade being persecuted for their faith. Uh, wearing a uniform in public, as was required of army women, even on leave, offered anonymity for Jewish refugee women. Figure four on the right side of the screen uh, depicts Sulzbacher with a group of her ATS friends in June 1945. She is second from left and just by the fact I had to point that out, kind of tells you that she's indistinguishable from her comrades. Her German and Jewish heritage is stripped away. Uh, it's obscured and it's irrelevant because the uniform is the main visual signifier and it paints that she's a loyal British subject. And this makes her performance of Englishness very simple. So perhaps most importantly, the experience of war work and being in uniform allowed female Jewish refugees to create new networks. Um, Ruth Schneider states that her senior officer in the ATS, who is an English born Jew, always made the four foreign girls, all of whom were Jewish refugees, lead parades. She also states that she was the first contact with a Jewish person from many of her English and Scottish Gentile comrades and that they found her very interesting for it. So just from her experiences, we gather that she's created new networks with English born Jews, other foreign Jewish refugees and English and Scottish Gentile people. A visual example of this is found in the Women's Land Army photos. 
the Jewish Museum London's archives revealed that the Women's Land Army was a very popular choice for Jewish women, both native born English Jewish women and Jewish refugee women. Um, it allowed them to interact with English people in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise necessarily. So figure, uh, sorry, <laughs> figure seven and eight uh, are members of the Jewish um, population who served in the Women's Land Army. And here we have a mixture of people. So the two women marked with X's are known to be Jewish and the rest of them are assumed not to be. Um, the fact that they are all in this same Women's Land Army uniform, which therefore makes them visually indistinguishable, is um, very important. And furthermore, you can see them taking tea, which is a very um, essential part of British culture. And it's something that perhaps if they hadn't been immersed in British society and British communities, they wouldn't have come in contact with. So the point of uniforms facilitating integration is solidified with this final image, um, which is taken at Lockswood Hall in Lincolnshire on Sulzbacher's 21st birthday. She stands in the middle in the pinafore dress Surrounded by friends she's made in her six years living in the UK and two years in the service. Her dark, stylish attire um, makes her indistinguishable from her peers, who we can assume are not Jewish. Through serving in uniform, refugees like Solzbacher were able to better perform their Englishness and integrate into British society. And for many Jews in services, the acceptance experienced served to strengthen a threatened Jewish identity. In summary, photographs depicting the clothes of female Jewish refugees in England between 1939 and 1945 illustrate the ways in which dress could indicate national belonging and reimagine Jewish identity. First, refugees had to navigate the fine line between appearing appropriately modest and quiet in dress and manner and appearing appropriately, inappropriately well-dressed for their perceived social standing. And in order to successfully perform their Englishness, they had to na uh, negotiate and navigate both of these things. Women who served in uniform experienced a sense of pride and demonstrated their loyalty to England. They strengthened their connection to their Jewishness by actively participating in the war against the Nazis and by experiencing acceptance. They were offered anonymity through their visual signifier as a uniformed service member, and they forged new networks with other Jews and with Gentiles. And some concluding points about photography. <laughs> so obviously photographs were the most plentiful resource I had for my research, and they served as visual evidence to kind of corroborate with the other primary sources, mostly oral histories that I used. And it really brought the experiences of Jewish refugee women living in Britain during this time to life. Secondly, we have to think about the fact that photos often commemorate something important. And this was particularly true during the Second World War when film was rationed. And those taking photos had to really plan their shots very carefully. Um, and if we look through some of these photos I've used in this presentation, we can see that. So the first figure um, is taken to commemorate Sulzbacher arriving with her foster family. This photo, we don't know necessarily what it was to celebrate or commemorate, but it very easily could have been taken um, to commemorate a birthday or a particular outing. These photos, the one on the left was likely her service ID photo, the top one. And the one on the right could have very well been taken to commemorate um, victory on a certain battle or perhaps because it seemed like the war was ending by this time. The photo on the left here is a studio portrait, which indicates that this woman was very proud of the fact that she was in the Women's Land Army. Um, the photo on the right here and this, uh, the next photo are more unique in that they are um, candids. They're taken un not professionally, and you can tell partly because the film quality is poorer, um, but this actually was taken to commemorate the fact that these two um, Women's Land Army girls had just delivered lambs for the first time. This one is very particular in that it's a screenshot of daily life. 
but in a sense it almost is commemorating this um, clinging to normality with the practice of taking tea. And finally, this photo was taken to commemorate her birthday um, and shows her integration and her acceptance and how she's managed to create a life for herself in this new country. Thank you.